So you would say you have not heard a strong biblical defense of the partial preterist position that keeps them from going all the way biblically. No, I have I have not. Other than the church has spoken. Wow. And we all know as Protestants, I can get around that. Yeah. Uh, Very easy. Uh, yeah, you better but, believe uh, it. Luther, Luther found a way, right? Don't ask me what I feel about myself. Ask me what I know about God. Ask me what I know about his word. I just realized something. He wasn't sleeping on a pillow. He was sleeping on purpose. Something to say I think is important but not essential would be like the inerrancy of scripture. Um, oh, wow. And okay. I hold to the inerrancy of scripture. Okay. The title of my sermon tonight is Why Church Nurseries Are Unscriptural and Wrong. And so that's why I have a baby on my hip right here. There is a level of anointing that I believe is gonna invade your homes, invade your sight, invade your senses. Um, that's going to, I literally feel that chains are gonna break off of you. Do you think I'm wrong? Yeah! yeah. Yay! So am I a bad guy for saying you're wrong? Yeah. I am? Yeah. <laughs> that's not fair. Hey, by the way, you are a slave. If you're not a slave of Christ, you're a slave of sin. You aren't free. Choose your master. Give us some men who know the truth. Now, I, I guess from the from the get go, we need to acknowledge up front that you are now. Before we get to your backstory, currently you are in the PCUSA, which yep. our listeners. We'll hyper say. liberal, hyper <laughs> yeah. LBGTQ. Uh, yeah, you're not wearing whole nine a, yards, a Hillary whole Clinton thing. t-shirt. What's going yeah. on? Yeah. <laughs> so, so uh, d- defend yourself, please, Doctor Frost. <laughs> Hillary Clinton t-shirt. So, in the PC USA, there's still a few. You can see Reformed Zoomer as a guy on YouTube, mm. um, and then there's the Fellowship Communion. That is a, in fact, I'm going to a convention in Nashville uh, in two weeks of the conservative PC USA holdouts that are still there. Wow. And so there is a constituency of them still there that I found out about Westminster Confession of Faith, folks. So so the and baker's dozen of you are going to have a great their, time in Nashville. Their mentality is uh, <laughs> we're sick of leaving these institutions that we have created mm. and we're sick of surrendering them. And we're staying until we are literally kicked out. We're staying. Um, and I admire that. That to me is the fight. Uh, sure. Oh, let's leave and start another denomination. And then that'll get corrupt in 50 years. And then we can start another and so forth and so on. So their, their mentality was just to stay and to witness uh, the gospel of Jesus Christ in the PCUSA. Like, and I admired that because I was working. I finished up my commentary on Daniel. And, you know, translating and working through the text of Daniel, Daniel always identified himself with the Israelites. He never Mm -hmm. left that identity. And his prayer moved me to great uh, tears um, in Daniel 9. Because he's assimilating himself. We have sinned. We have turned our backs on you. We have done these things. Now, Daniel himself personally didn't do anything you know, to, to deserve exile. Right. Daniel is a man after God's own heart. He's covenantally faithful to God. That's demonstrated in the text. He's not an idol worshiper or any of those types of things. But he is an Israelite, and the Israelites have sinned, and so he gets punished right along with them. And I see myself in the church, and the church is what the church is. Whether you like it or not, hmm. you are identified with it. The Billy Grahams, the Jim Bakers, the Oral Roberts, all of it. You're you're a Christian. That's on you. And <laughs> I take that. And I think that Jesus takes that too, which means there's a lot of shame and humiliation <laughs> out of that that goes along with that. And I I think that sometimes we say, Oh, I'm not like them. I'm not like those guys. And I don't know if God, at least for me personally, where where I'm at, um, I have to watch that. And then yeah. secondly. The church that I was called to is a rural community. Um, this the Indiana's farmlands. This you know, churches are about twenty to thirty to forty people. 
they don't know anything that's going on in the hierarchy, nor do they, they, these are hardworking, good Christian people that are just, they love God and they want to do right by their family and this, that, and the other. So I don't want to judge the people inside a church building just because it says Presbyterian on the outside. I don't know what's on the inside. That was another lesson I think the Spirit taught me. Don't, and I felt like with, with Peter, um, don't call unclean what I've, what I've called clean. <laughs> it's like, oh, right, I'm not God. I keep forgetting that I'm not God, but or that I know what God knows. <laughs> you know, it's, it's a, it's a life God, God keeps reminding me, You're, you don't know what I know. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah. I'm like, oh, right, I'm not God. So the so that just kind of pulled me in. And then I thought, do I have liberty of conscience to express the fact that, you know, I'm a Trump supporting MAGA voting, Bible thumping, young <laughs> earth creationist? <laughs> you know, um, you know one, of the, one of the worst Christians you'd ever meet, you know, in that regard, <laughs> every liberal's nightmare. Would you accept me? And uh, they all did. And I'm now an elder and I'm enro enrolled in the uh, Columbia Theological Seminary through the uh, Commission Ruling Elder Program there. And I thought, okay, um, great. <laughs> wow. So, so that's my story there. And the, when I explained this, to because all the I went to a Reformed Baptist convention more or less, uh, and gave a speech there on full preterism, and you know James White and Sam Walter and all these guys were there. All these Reformed Baptists were there, and I'm the only you know like one or two Presbyterians there. But they all asked me about PCUSA, oh, and I sure. explained. So I explained all of that to them, and all of them, every one of ministers, every single one of them, and it was so encouraging. They all looked at me and just said, "Go for it." And I, I thought, thank you. They said, yeah, go go for it. You know, and I thought, yeah, I am. Uh, the doors are open and I'm and I'm until I'm kicked out. Um, my conscience is still able to function as personally before God and what I'm responsible for, what I'm accountable for. Um, I haven't had any confrontations or anything yet. Maybe after watching this, they might. Well, well, God bless you, brother. Um, I mean, yeah, if you can hold that line and be someone who's teaching the word of God and standing firm on that, which you are to stand firm on. And uh, if they kick you out, they kick you out if that's your mentality. But if but if you can be wouldn't be the first time, <laughs> but but if you can be someone who can help create good change, I mean, that would be awesome. So, I'm meeting wonderful, good God fearing people, so Bible believing. You know, we just had Wednesday night Bible study. Uh, we're going through the book of Revelation, and um, another person came, so that's growing. And yeah, we're I'm loving it. I'm like, just Sweet. so God's just saying, just teach the Bible, just teach the word, just go through okay. the Bible, teach the Bible. That's all you got to do. Okay, well, good. Well, um, in addition to that, another difference that we have is I believe from an interview I saw you do with someone else or listen to, you're you're all mill now. Um, I'm dispensational pre-mill, so we're coming at, okay. at this eschatology-related issue from two different perspectives. However, um, we are both talking about the issue of full or hyper-preterism as yeah. uh, a, a heresy in the church. We can look at both other. of our enemies. Yeah. yeah, right. And we can look at each other and say, uh, we're brothers, and then we can look at those who are in full preterism and say, they are believing something heretical. And so, right, right, right. Um, so anyway, I just wanted to put all the cards on the table there so everyone's aware. <clears throat> but as we get into this topic of full preterism, perhaps it would be helpful just to give the succinct definition because you never know who's listening and who might know whatever, or might not know whatever. So if you could give a brief definition of what full preterism is and then kind of jump into your history with it. If we could now go back in time and uh, talk about your experience back then, that would that would be really helpful. So you want to lay all that out for us? Yeah, I said this so many times now um and i'm thankful thank that you invited me the on here and all the invites that i get from a, a lot of podcasts so to get the word get the word out there so i you know raised in church dispensational uh four square gospel church i was in schofield bible and hal Lindsay and all that kind of stuff i'm 56 so this is back in the um early 70s as early as I can remember being in church, which was five, six years old. Um, and so, and have maintained, uh, even in the days of 
walking in the valleys of the shadows of death, you know, where you're out there doing your sowing your oats, doing your thing. God always brings you back in. I'm getting older now, I'm looking back, and there's a lot of people that have that testimony when I start telling them my own personal walk with the Lord, which has been since child childhood. You know, it's it's I love church. I always come back to church. Um, but Bible college opened up, you know, the doors that should to the various millennial views, and there I encountered all millennial and post-millennial and went post-millennial. Um, because that was just an exciting thing to hear. So you went dispensational to post mill? Yeah. Wow. That's quite the leap, my friend. It's a it's a big leap. You know, and you think you read these things on psychology, and I read a lot of psychology. And so one of the attacks, and then atheism. So then one of the attacks on Christianity is, oh, you were born that way, your parents, so you took your church. That's why you're Christian. So it's a behavioral saying that that's what you're not because of the Holy Spirit mm. zapped you and, you know, God exists and all this stuff. So it's just a behavioral thing. You want to please your parents. Um, but in reading a lot of that, there is something to say that in the way that we're raised, and that's the way that I believe. And so when confronted, challenged with that, you see different paradigms from equally um, in, in the context of a let's agree to disagree context of Christian, you know, ecumenism, you know, that kind of stuff. So that allows like, oh, we can have differences. Now, mm -hmm. growing up, I'm just thinking it's just this one, this four square gospel. That's it. That's what other expression of Christianity. You'd point to people and oh, those people. We're not like those people, the Nazarenes. You know, you don't want to be like the Nazarene. The PC USA. <laughs> yeah. The PC USA. Or even the PCA or the OPC. Sure. Or yeah. any of those God's frozen, chosen, uh, disgusting Calvinists mm. you know, who believe, you know, the baby killers, you know, Calvinists. Because I've heard everything about that. Yeah. That you're, you're talking about, uh, let's see, the baby killers going back to the, like, Reformation. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Yeah. You hear... You, yeah, different Calvin's conversation murder. for a different. Calvin's way. a murderer, yeah, and all this bunch of stuff. You're like, okay, um, so you're you're just exposed to a lot. And I was uh, always a kind of a book nerd, but it really opened up in my second year there. And we had great professors, and two of them really noticed something in me, and took me under their wings, and just you know mentored. So the, now I worked in the bookstore. And so we were getting these flyers in um, Tyler, Texas. And David Chilton, uh, Gary North, Ray Sutton, James Jordan, Ken Gentry, Gary Damar. These guys were uh, writing all these books with wonderful artwork on the color on the covers. <laughs> so mm. naturally start reading them. And then a guy on campus handed me uh, Paradise Restored by David Chilton. And so that, you know, and I'm young. You got to think here. I'm, I'm 19, 19, 20 years old. So I'm young in college. And, and at this point, I'm assuming since you were like following the post mill train, yeah, you, definitely. you had a view of the future kind of it understood like, okay, this is optimistic victory. Open getting better. Future. Um, how much of AD 70 and uh, the, the events Bunch. related to AD 70, did you understand at 19 when you started getting into Chilton? Chilton is, who eventually became a hyper preterist. Right. Um, so, which I can't blame him. Uh, may he rest in peace. Mm. And I had an opportunity to, to talk to David Chilton. I called him and talked to him on the phone back, back then when he had the phone before the internet. So, um, that view in just, it just, caught me hook, line, and sinker. And the main reason why it did is because of these time texts, what we call time texts. Some of you standing here shall not taste death, the son of man. You won't finish going through the cities of Israel. This generation. Comes. This generation. So you're getting all this uh, kind of stuff with Jesus a liar. You know, oh no, Jesus is not a liar. Well, then he came in that generation. So that's, that's the force of that because you don't want Jesus to be a liar. Hmm. God forbid. Yeah, And at that age, I'm not sophisticated enough to have 
the arsenal of um, academic material that I now have at the age of 56. Now of translating, I'm pretty proficient at Greek and Hebrew hmm. um, in, in translating. I'm confident. And I've had that reviewed by, you know, others. And they said, yeah, you've, you can you can get around the text. Said, okay, good. <laughs> Coming from an expert, that's good. I'll take that. Um, so, yeah, at, at a young, impressionable age, uh, near means near. What it says, and so and, Jesus and, and you were years. learning exactly what then in Chilton's book, just to give that definition. At oh, this point ninety-five percent of the Bible is fulfilled by the time of seventy A.D. What well, what's no. the five percent that's being left out? Every second but... coming, uh, the resurrection of the dead, and the end of history, and the so great at that, the at great that time. Judgment. Then Chilton was still holding out on a future physical. In Paradise Restored, he was. Okay, yes. okay, yeah, he was still post millennial. Uh, there in that book, and, and Days and, of Vengeance, and, his commentary on Revelation. He later came out with Days of Vengeance. Which, so, real quick, then at this point, know. then would you say at that time he was a partial preterist? That's would, would that be the appropriate taxonomy for his view? Then that nine, like everything but the second coming and the resurrection has been fulfilled. Therefore, he yeah he was a partial preterist, just not a full one yet. Yeah, we kind of invented the phrase partial. <laughs> As far as I can remember, like Don Preston, because that when I became a full preterist, um, so partial preterism, a phrase that wasn't being used in the 90s, that kind of started getting used around in the 2000s. And we made a joke about being partially pregnant. <laughs> As oh, full okay. preterists, we were saying partial preterism. That's silly. You're either a preterist or you're not. Mm. You know, there's no wiggle partial, partial past. So that that's really interesting because now I think a lot of people find comfort in I can be a partial preterist. Um, so you know I, I I'm not a heretic, but I can dance with the line of yeah of you know yeah. everything is it's truly everything respected. fulfilled. Because hmm. I'm not I don't even classify myself as preterist. Me neither. Now <laughs> does that mean that Jesus didn't fulfill the prophecy of being born in Bethlehem and Micah? Hmm. Yeah, that's past. Hmm. No one else will ever fulfill that. That's yeah. there's no double fulfillments going on there. Okay, yeah, that's it. He fulfilled it. Done, and many others. Does that make me a preterist? Because that's an, a line we well, everybody's a preterist. No, no, that's wow. See, that's that's this ingenious because you can't. That's not what we're saying. Mm. Uh, yes, everybody has. Uh, everyone understands the hermeneutic of original audience relevance and original intent, authorial intent of the text and all of that. First century, second temple Judaism, and obviously. Um, and we, we get all that. That's been around for centuries. The preterists didn't invent that. That's been around for a long time. They try to take credit for this stuff. Hmm. So, you, so for the first time thinking I'm 20, 21 years old, Original audience relevance, you think, oh, this is the first time you hear about this kind of stuff. Because growing up in church, often, you don't hear that kind of hermeneutic uh, aspect of what did this mean to the original audience in Corinth in 54 AD when Paul wrote to them. You don't usually hear that from the pulpit. It's it's always a modern day application. Right. The Bible says, you know, so that's the vein that I grew up in. So in college, you start hearing, well, what did it mean to them? And then you start reading church history, church philosophy, church, you know, all this other stuff. And you begin to see that, oh, that, yeah, that's pretty standard. Uh, grammatical, historical foundations that really thrived post-Reformation, really came out of that Reformation. We're translating the Bible now into the vernacular of whatever nation you happen to be in, Germany, France, whatever. We weren't doing this before. Hmm. Um, so, but now we are with the event. Now we were, the church was. You can go back and read early fathers where they're applying that. You, you find them here and there applying that. Certainly Augustine's playing, applying it. But not with the grammatical, historical kind of right. research Learn the languages. See that you know Latin. Twelfth <laughs> century, thirteenth century, fifth. You got to know Latin. You'd have to know Greek, Hebrew. Mm. Eh, nah, 
don't need to know Hebrew. Why would you need to know Hebrew? <laughs> so all of that changed. And so you go back and read that and you think, yeah, what did it mean to the first century? So that's those are the kinds of the things that as a young mind, again, 2020, that's bringing me in thinking, well, yeah, that can't apply to uh, to them 2,000 years. Yeah, that's a long time. If Jesus said near in this generation, and this generation can't mean this race, because then you start looking at the etymology of Ganea there, mm. your Greek's kicking in, and you start seeing there's alternatives. There's alternative interpretations. Not all of the church has held to in agreement. There's no consensus. Uh, there's rooms for variables and all this kind of stuff. So that's where um, I went down the post-millennial preterist line, thinking, well, if it's a viable option, I'll go down that line. Certainly many respectable people in the past have held to, you know, this. And then I met uh, Max King. Hmm. Max King was a full pre a hyper preterist. And I met Ed Stevens. Those those two people first and foremost. But that came through a recommendation of the material that uh, Gentry and DeMar and Sutton and Jordan and Chilton had introduced me to. And that's two other figures. That was James Stuart Russell, who wrote the Parousia in 1898. And then Milton Terry, who was a fairly well-known uh, author. He wrote Biblical Hermeneutics, which is a fairly large book in the 19th century. And that was a text book that was used where he's drawing in and utilizing all German critical scholarship. So 19th century, you're putting all that together. So Milton Terry wrote this really large book. Nobody reads him today except preterists, but you know. So so these guys who weren't at the time full preterists were introducing you to full preterists. They were still reading them and gleaning them and actually in a way endorsing them in, in such a sense. Saying not to follow them all the way, but... We're good. Okay. We're, we're, we're Paul they... J. Stuart Russell all the way. He goes mm -hmm. too far, but in the mm -hmm. main, he's good. So you read J. Stuart Russell, he's got 1 Corinthians 15 literally happening in 70 AD. People are literally being raptured and changed and mm -hmm. flown up to heaven, getting new bodies. Uh, all of the dead got new bodies in heaven. So that event took place. 1 Thessalonians 4, 1 Corinthians 15, that took place in 70 AD. And you think, again, growing up as a dispensation, you hear, you think, well, that's, that's, well, it's mind blowing. Yeah. Right. What it is. How do you get there? So the, those guys who. I couldn't go there at first. I didn't. I was like, that's too. That's, sure. Uh, yeah. No way. And the, guy, and the guys who were warning you not to follow them all the way. But, we're the partial predators post-millennialists. Yeah, and and yeah. But they were still saying in the main they're good. So, but they in the main, Milton Terry's good. They weren't necessarily recognizing their full preterism as heresy then, because I mean, I can't imagine. You know, you'd say, you know, someone like well, the, uh, the full stuff was, yeah, they, but yeah, there okay. wasn't that much around. That, see, that, that's the thing, and huh. so we're talking about the '90s. So the only thing that was really around was Max Max King who had written the spirit of prophecy in the 70s. Hmm. So he, and then he wrote this massive work in 1986 or 87 um, called the cross and the parousia of Christ. And that's a 900, 800 page tome yeah. <laughs> where, yeah. you know, he's, he's an, a, a lay scholar. I mean, this guy is, his bibliography is, you know, 25 pages. So, so what, what got you then from, I, I can't go there to then you're in. Well, you keep reading the preterist material, and I was footnoted. I, I, I found out about Max King and Ed Stevens. I found out about them through a footnote through David Chilton's Days of Vengeance book. So he footnoted Max King. And I'm the book geek that I am. I read footnotes, and then I try to find the book that you footnoted so I can read where you footnoted the right there I'm with like, you brother yeah. everyone said if i didn't go into theology i should have gone into law school <laughs> hmm. you know, because i'm just i'm i'm you know i've always been that way as my dad told because you've always were a tinkerer you know yeah <laughs> taking stuff apart and finding out how it worked hmm. well to a fault um it doesn't bode well for relationships what do you mean by that <laughs> <laughs> so, 
I, I hear a lot. Man, you're being defensive. I'm like, no, I'm not. I'm just wanting explanation. Yeah. What, what do you linguistics kick in and uh -huh. logic and all the other stuff? So after you know a couple of decades of study, yeah, it becomes really crazy in the head. The no the noise in my head. So, um, so I read that Max King and it made sense. So, and I remember I spoke with uh, Tommy Ice and Mark Hitchcock. They came and did a conference with us wow. and debated Mark uh, or debated uh, Don Preston, and we hosted hosted that. So I had the pleasure, you know, of uh, bringing them and and then taking them out to that and just really getting to pick their brain because even though I disagreed with them, I was still, you know, like wow, Tommy Ice, you know, you know. <laughs> now Mark Hitchcock wasn't quite as known. He was yeah. just doing his dissertation in Dallas. Um, on the time, the date of Revelation. So he wasn't as known as he is now. Hmm. Um, now he's like everywhere. I, right. I see Hitchcock everywhere. But Thomas Ice, I knew who he was. I thought, ah, oh, Thomas Ice. So I said, listen, are we consistent if, if all of Matthew 24, forget 25, if all of Matthew 24 is fulfilled in 70 AD, if I took that route, would I have to include First Thessalonians four and First Corinthians fifteen. They mm -hmm. said absolutely, absolutely. You cannot, you can't take those out. It's 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 an all or nothing thing, and so the preterist, indeed, the whole literature, um, which is vast, on Matthew twenty four is where do you, where seventy A D end and the future begin, and you know this. That that's the whole discussion in scholarship. Yeah. Is where, 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 or is it wholly future? It, Jesus is not. He might pass a glance at seventy A.D. Thomas I said that he goes. He he, he casts a glance at it, <laughs> you know. But it's not the focal point of what he's going after. Hmm. There will be a time when there is a future abomination of desolation that seventy right. A.D. does not meet. Now that's coming from a dispensational, yeah. and I, which I understood. I thought, yeah, you'd have to say that because, yeah, once you go down that route, it's all 70 AD. Whereas now with progressive dispensationalism, you've got Daryl Bach, Craig Blazing, guys yes. like that who will say there's yes, uh, right. there's uh, something going on in 70 AD that's actually foreshadowing. It's more than casting a glance. It's God intentionally foreshadowing that abomination of desolation that's coming. But yeah, more of a uh, traditional dispensational view would say, yeah, more it's it's an event that happened. Jesus prophesied that it would happen in Luke 20. I find that hard to get around. And I love the work of, of what block and, and blazing and others were, yeah. what they call reformed dispensate or progressive dispensation, yes. whatever they were calling it at the time. Nineties. They were, yeah. you know, I was starting to read that and I was thinking, yeah, see, even they, and, and Tommy did, he said, I, it's hard to say. I said, it's, if you apply grammatical, it's hard, but, and as a full preterist, then back then I was thinking it's all, you know, it's all of it. Now I'm more the my Greek and everything else is a little bit is far more proficient than it was then. But I'm just to explain to you the mentality then. Sure. And so all the pronouns, you, you disciples. He's not talking to me, he's not talking to you in the 20th century. He's talking to them. You will see. And so all of that cascades together, it comes together and flows, and then you read it all. So what's the problem? Well, you got to read First Corinthians in fifteen and First Thessalonians four too. Yeah, that's the partial preterist problem. Mm. So I shifted the ball back. Yeah, okay, the dispensationalist has their things, but at least they're admitting it. But you guys aren't even admitting it. You guys are trying to split this apart. You can't. You can't split this apart. If all of 24 is fulfilled, so is 1 Corinthians 15. Because it's the that, same language. It's yes. the same. Every scholar sees this. So you go to the critical scholars. They say the same thing. Yeah, 1 Thessalonians 4. Well, obviously, Paul had heard the pericope or of some of the statements or Q statements from Jesus concerning the Olivet Discourse. And Paul had heard this. And that's that's what he's referring to there. And I'm like, yeah, sure. What else would he have heard? Yeah, that, that word parousia, the Greek word, which means his coming. And he uses it, yeah. Right. He uses it in Matthew 24, and right. then it's used again in those other texts. And so, yeah, it's... Second Thessalonians, right. Yeah. You you have to conclude there are two parousias if you believe twenty four Matthew 24 has happened, but not those other ones. Then there are two parousias, but to be consistent, it's like, well, it's all or nothing. It's How many, how many ends 
is Jesus talking about when he talks about the end? Right. right. Just there's just one. Unless he, unless Jesus was a dispensationalist and he's talking about the end of one dispensation. Yeah, right. <laughs> that yeah. could really mess this whole conversation up. Yeah, maybe uh, maybe you know, maybe there's six or seven dispensations. To come. I don't. I mean, when you're making this stuff up as you go along, yeah, right. in order to cram it in and make your system float. And I didn't like that because I was also studying very heavily. I was studying logic, you know, just textbook logic. So you'd read copies, text, or, you know, introduction to logic, you know, these standard Cohen, you know, mm -hmm. these standard texts that you would read on introduction to logic. And I, I hated mathematics in school. I couldn't stand numbers. Mm -hmm. But logic, I loved that. I could sit and write the set like, oh, this is... Yeah, you're a tinkerer, of course. Well, the people say, why can't you do that with numbers? I say, I don't, I, I just, I don't, my brain, I don't know. I don't like numbers. I'm not a big number guy. Hmm. But I, this symbol stuff, I love this. And so you start applying this, you know, the consistency thing. And that's, you, so you want to be consistent. And no, so I, full I, preterism I, was the consistent route for me. I thought I've got to go this route. And I'm already 95% there. What's preventing me yeah. from... Going the whole route. Well, the church tradition. Nobody believes this. You and maybe five other guys you can fit in the taxi cab. And that's about it. So we're facing that. But you get around that in logic by appeal to the population yeah. or popularity, which sure. is the palace. Well, <laughs> now, at this point in your story, I'd like to jump to modern day just to kind of relate to what's going on when you think of the Demar situation, and even looking at Doug Wilson and looking at Jeff Durbin and what's going on, uh, maybe in his view too, you've got these guys who are partial preterists at, by their own self taxonomy, and they do yeah. flirt, flirt with yeah. that line. And in Demar's case, seems like he's crossed the line now, and he's full preterist. At this and, point, who cares? Yeah, he doesn't. He yeah, doesn't. So, so just as you were struggling with, okay, I'm 95 percent of the way there. Why can't I go the other five? and you had tradition holding you back, is that what's holding Wilson and Durbin guys like that back? Or do you think they're not actually holding back and they're maybe crossing the line? No, I don't know their heart. I, I would never question the intent. And I have to go by their words. Sure. And, and Jeff, I know a little more than I do uh, Doug Wilson, who I've never met. Okay. I've just read his uh, work. I'm reading, I'm going to write some blogs on his, the, the man, when the man comes around, mm. his commentary on Revelation, which right out of the gate, um, the first two pages is uh, a a hyper preterist could have written that. And, and what's right the, out of the what, gate? What, what what does he say? Oh, that soon means soon in the opening three verses. The times at hand obviously refers to events that would have take that took place in the seven churches that he's writing to his lifetime. Which means that the entire book of the book of Revelation, except for the the last tiny parts at the end, you got to hang on to that because that keeps you in church tradition. But the rest of the book, hmm. and again, my logic, I'm like, well, that's pretty arbitrary. <laughs> you're just, yeah, you're just slicing through what is, what's not, and so as I and but the you know that's the opening three pages of of Wilson's book could have been written by a hyper preterist. So I, I, and I would not be able to tell the difference be, between what he's what he's doing there. And so that see, that alarms me because now I can think back because my memory is pretty sharp. I can think back to when I'm 19, 20 years old in Bible college, reading that and my own slippery slope venture into full preterism by reading this kind of material. This is exactly the kind of material that I was reading that led me down that whole kind of path. So I'm not saying it automatically, because you know, Durbin and these guys obviously are not going that whole route. Actually, they condemn it. They're very strong in their condemnation of it. My beef is, do you have a ground to condemn it? And I know that you condemn it. I know that you don't adhere to it. I know that Wilson condemns it. I know that. But, I don't fault but, but you're saying their their ground right now is church tradition, and it's, all it does is take a flip of the switch on. I don't care. Very, very flimsy. Yeah, yeah. I, I don't care about the confession of faith anymore. They were wrong on that, and then that's it. Then then you're gone, right? I mean, yeah. that's okay. 
Um, no, you ha you haven't pre the only uh, barrier that you have presented to me is the Westminster Confession of Faith and the Apostles' Creed, and that's I can I can blow through those pretty quick. So you would say you have not heard a strong biblical defense of the partial preterist position that keeps them from going all the way biblically. No. I have I have not, other than the church has spoken. Wow. And we all know as Protestants, I can get around that. Yeah. Uh, Very easy. Yeah, you better believe it. Luther found a way, right? I can get around that. Yeah. And I don't care if and see that I'm thinking logically now. I don't care about your personal well. I I used to have there was a Dr. Gary Crampton and Dr. Talbot. They were two other mentors, um, Dr. Talbot Moore. So they, they they were grilling me all the time while I was doing seminary work. Yeah, I'm, I'm a heretic. You know, I'm all these things. But they liked me and I liked them. <laughs> and they let me complete coursework and get degree and all that kind of stuff. Even though I would never be allowed to teach in the, you know, <laughs> I was censured heavily. <laughs> So, but Dr. Talbot took a liking to me because he's just said, it, he every time I saw him, he was just, I'm praying for you to come out of this. You've got to come out of this. I'm like, oh no, you've got to come into it. Wow. We we're trying to convert each other. And so he did say, or Dr. Crampton said, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a one in a million chance that the church is wrong on this. So my logic mind kicks in and says, well, one in a million chance, well, then there's a chance. You're telling me there's a chance. Telling me there's a chance. And if there's a chance, I'll take it. So I don't want any chance. Uh, but as long as you leave that. So that's my that's my new pronged approach on the Wilsons and the Durbans, who I have nothing against them as brothers. I have nothing against their work as servants and laborers in the field of church work. No, so I don't speak about any of that. But your doctrine on eschatology is sloppy. Hmm. And you don't have a defense from young people that were like myself back then reading this and making the connecting the dots and going full predator. So my second, my second thing thinking about this, because doing these programs, and you're one of the first, and I appreciate, yeah, appreciate this. Is no defense. My second one is. Since this is a little weak over here, and since you're so close to the view of the full preterist over, over here, shouldn't, and since Gary DeMar is of the caliber of person that he is, uh, whose work has influenced tens of thousands of Christians. Well, yeah, I mean, I mean, Durbin undoubtedly. The, the, the guys in Phoenix, the Apologia guys, they used to call He's him. He's more popular Uncle than Gary. Wilson or Durbin or any of these guys. Gary DeMar, I've been reading Gary DeMar since, yeah, 89, 99. But, but, but they, they called him Uncle Gary, right? All Uncle Gary. Yeah. He's the guy. He, he was like the. So again, I'm 18, 19, 20 years old. And I, the, the thought that I would speak at a conference and Gary DeMar is on the same ticket, that was. I was, and then I roomed with him. That just blew. I was like, in that's like meeting Elvis Presley or something. Mm -hmm. And my, I was just like, ah, Gary Demar. You know, I get starstruck too. So, um, even though people react that way with me, and I don't understand it, they want me to sign <laughs> the book, and I'm like, you want me to sign my? That's what? funny. And now I can understand where Gary's like, you want me? I don't want because Gary's like, I'm just a guy. I'm not anybody. So, um, but but since Gary is who he is, you. <clears throat> you don't want to say Gary is not a Christian, that he's not saved. This man staunchly stands on the confession that Jesus Christ was raised from the dead and ascended to the right hand of God. <laughs> he stands on that. Submit to him now or die. Yeah. That's that's his message. And yet he will he will not condemn full preterism. Do you see why? Mm. Can you blame him? So, again, that goes back into my that first point that I made, the weak defense. See, Gary has gone that way. So if you're not going to become a full preterist or if you don't condone becoming a full preterist, 
at least you don't have to be so hard hmm. on the full preterists. Let them in. Yeah. Let them sit at the table. It's another eschatology view. We can agree to disagree like I do with you, my dispensational brother. Yeah, right. I can agree to disagree with you, and, and you and I are, are wonderful and fine. Well, the same relationship should be extended to the full preterist. Mm. So that's that's the, the 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 things that I'm seeing there. As an expert in this field, both experientially and in terms of, of knowledge and time, spending three decades in this. Hmm. Now, personally, meeting all the major key players and being one of them. Yeah. For, for 10 years, I was one of the main speakers on the ticket with Don Preston and Dave Curtis and Larry Siegel and Max King and Doug King. Michael Sullivan. Spoke with Michael Sullivan wrote books. Don publishes my book. And it's interesting that Gary DeMar won't debate me. Uh, Doug Wilson won't debate me. None of these guys will, they want to, they, they're not ringing my foot. They're not, they don't want to. Um, Durbin reached out a little bit through an instant message. And then that was the last I heard of him. Okay. Yeah. I want to debate these guys because I want to say, because, and I'll tell you this. I'm at the place where if there was enough people that was starting to come around saying, we, maybe we need to look at these, you know, is Michael Sullivan a heretic? Is he condemned to hell? Is he a damnable heretic? Or is he somebody we can bring into the fold and say, Mike, you're really, really, really wrong on this. That you're a brother. Hmm. We're, we're, you, do you see what, maybe elaborate yeah. So, so that you're okay, not hearing my words. I, how is that filtering through your mind? What am I what am I saying? So. Well, it is kind of interesting to compare it to dispensationalism because so many strong reformed brothers will almost treat dispensationalism that way, where it's like Oh yes. Um yeah. Yeah, they're they're Christians but barely kind of thing. And uh, especially That's unfortunate. When, yeah. The, the, but I mean, I can see their point too. When you go back and look at the Hal Lindsey type stuff, I mean that that kind of older stuff that's yeah. not based yeah. on the Word of God and it's based on goofy newspaper theology type uh, stuff. I, I can see where that strong reaction comes from. But um, it is very difficult. I mean, you hear someone like Michael Sullivan, who came to uh, basically the preterist position through Calvinism, and I think he was. Oh, he's master. reformed. Yeah, yeah, he was a master's grad first. He was like, he was a Calvinistic dispensationalist, and we were one of the few. We were one of the few sovereign grace, full preterists. Right. And wow. Yeah. And yeah. and so he he becomes full on Calvinist, then becomes reformed, and then becomes preterist. It was like a very natural type progression, sure. but. We believe you do cross a very strong line when you become full preterist and you deny the return of Jesus Christ and the resurrection from the dead for uh, for us. I mean, that's a, that's a line you cross where you go into heresy land. And um, at yeah. that point, you have to cut off fellowship with those types of people because even though they may have a whole bunch of stuff right, if the one or two or three percent of their theology that they get wrong, whatever the case may be, is that level of wrong, then we say, um, you got to come out of this. Like that professor was saying to you, I'll be praying for you. You got to come out of this. Um, we can still be yeah. friends. I can still like love on you here as a like friend to friend. But as far as Christian fellowship, we can't have it because you're not a Christian. You can, you're confessing something that's unchristian. That's my view. I have a, so as a minister, I use the, the book of common prayer a lot, hmm. 1928. Yeah. And um, which, you know, you find this in ministers, manuals, you know, whatever's everything post book of common prayer is using it one way or the other there, because it just was such a impactful book on history, what Cranmer did. So uh, you look at, go to the funeral part. First Corinthians 15, First Thessalonians. <laughs> this is standard stuff. Uh, this is the hope. Uh, ashes to ashes, dust to us, dust to dust. That's all Cranmer's work. That's but that's so embedded that a a dispensationalist could use this funeral manual and sure. bring it right on in. Any a Church of Christ, a charismatic or an Assembly of God person could use this mm -hmm. in the funeral. And then it has the Nicene Creed and has the Apostles' Creed and all that. This is standard. Um, so 
you're pulling a few planks out of there. Uh, which, okay, we can say is, is great. You, you can do that. But you do not have a defense against pulling out he's the only begotten of the Father. I can, I can take that one out in two. And the Holy Spirit is God. Yeah. I can pull that one out too. I mean, if we're going to pull them out, <laughs> we can just start pulling them all out. Yeah, so, right, yeah. And so the, the, the whole... This is where the restorationist argument comes from. Once you start doing this, why do you need them at all? Mm. You, you see where that went. Mm -hmm. And so if you read Barton Stone or these other guys, that's where they went. They said, well, you guys agree to disagree on all this other stuff. And you, you know, you and the Catholics both confess the Apostles' Creed, but you don't agree on what descent into hell means. Jesus descended into hell. Mm -hmm. What does that mean? Or you believe in one faith and then it says one baptism but clearly we don't all believe in the creed on what baptism is so we're not saying the same type of thing so they began to just whittle away at that and then once that dam is opened just you know all you right. need is the bible it well that's why it comes back to it comes back to the word of god and not tradition i mean if we were just doing tradition it's and difficult we could to easily... get around that argument yeah, we, we could just say all things are equal, and so pick and choose what theology you, you want to have, and it what it's all good. But if we right. say, based on exegesis of the Word of God, true study of the Bible that God has given us, that we can understand, you are transgressing something that He has revealed to us that's pretty transparent and straightforward, yeah. that we are to hope for, to wait for His Son from heaven, that is the the charge for the church here is to wait for the appearing of the son who saves us from the wrath that is to come the blessed hope that we have to use titus 2 language i mean this is the word of god that gives us this not tradition and for me that's why it's yeah. pretty uh, cut and dry you are outside of christian fellowship if you take a full preterist position my amen because when i read paul Regardless of, of what millennial stance you come at it, if Christ be not raised, there's no resurrection of the dead. And if there be no resurrection of the dead, your faith is in vain. This is not an issue where Paul said you can agree to disagree on what That's resurrection right. is. Yeah. This right. is this is a do or die. Yep. Um yep. and he references heretics that say the resurrection's already come. They had come into the current some of these men, some of them. We don't know who they were, believers, unbelievers. I don't we don't know specific, but Paul mentioned, you know, some. How can some uh, so I translated work through first Corinthians 15. So you, when he says you plural, he's speaking to you believers, you believers, you who I've had confidence, you believe it's always you. And then when he refers to these outsiders who are agitating, they'll say some, some among you believers who've heard my message, some among you have come in and how can some among you say, there's no, but these guys were able to come in, so they were tolerable people. These were not, you know, baby killers or anything. These were nice yeah. Greeks coming in or doing whatever they were doing, and uh, good people. You know, they they were not persecuting the church. Obviously, they were coming in, sitting with them, and and sharing and doing all the rest of it. And they just had a hard time with this idea of resurrection of the dead. They just, which is understandable because it's not the easiest thing in the world to wrap your mind around. You know how bodies eaten by sharks thousand years ago are going to be raised not an easy question to answer no it can be answered but it's not an easy one. yeah so nonetheless paul is adamant about this he does not tolerate it hmm. uh, these men are fools these men are ignorant of god these men are bad company corrupts good character all the things that he's he's saying there because this is a non-negotiable issue yeah and Hymenaeus and so here we got a version of two guys that are teaching the resurrection. Spiritual has already passed already. Whatever they were, uh, pre Gnostic, whatever they were doing with it, we don't know clearly what they were doing. It's obviously they were spiritualizing it to some mm -hmm. some degree, and that was in the air. We know this about Greeks. Um, some of them had a tendency to you know spiritualize and esoteric and all this. So, whatever they were doing. 
Paul condemns them in the most strongest terms because they're not adhering to his specific doctrine of what resurrection of the dead is. There's no wiggle room here. Yeah, that's right. So that to me is whatever Paul taught on resurrection, that's the view that I want to have hmm. because for Paul, that view was, was there's no rooms for, this is not Adiaphora stuff here hmm. that he mentions, uh, yeah, issues to get debated about. Yeah. It's not opinions. It's not. So that's the case that you would have to make if you were going to be accepting like Gary DeMar is. So I think yeah, Wilson doesn't want to go that route. But the problem with people like Wilson who do condemn it is that you've gone so far down the preterist route is that you basically have opened the gates to full preterism. You give them 99% of their argument. And then you try to hold on to that one percent, which is basically the confession of faith. And yeah, uh, yeah. yeah, that it's hard to see. And how it doesn't that will... work because what's going on in First Corinthians fifteen is what's going on in Matthew twenty four. Yeah, that 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 is what they're asking. Well, and it, it seems uh, when's the end of the age? When is it's hard to imagine that 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 view the the okay, we'll give you all of your argument, we'll follow you all the way down the line till the very last step. It's hard to imagine how that will last multiple generations. It seems like people who are trained in that thinking yeah. before long, either them or their kids are going to capitulate there and that just won't last. Yeah. The, the word of God lasts. Traditions don't last. Yeah. You just pick up, just pick them apart after a while, you know? So, so, well, you, we get back to what we were saying before. Uh, when is the end? When is the end of the age? When is it? He must reign until he puts all of his enemies under his feet. And then the end. Yeah. First Corinthians 15. Oh, so the end of the age in Matthew 24 is not the end that Paul hmm. mentions in First Corinthians. So there's two ends. Hmm. There's a 70 AD end. The end of the age. And that's not the end hmm. that Paul's talking about. In first. So now there's two ends. Okay, you do realize in the history of the church, nobody has ever argued that position before hmm. until the partial preterist post-millennialists showed up. Hmm. They started making these kind of arguments. So you can't fault them on being new. You, you see what I'm saying? You can't. Yeah. It's like you've invented something now. Now you've got two ends. Well, maybe there's two resurrections. Maybe there... Well, some people have two resurrections. It this is where it, it's like if you go, if you're going to let it get this kind of broad, then the full preterists can join in on the conversation. Well, let me let me do a few quick hit anyway. questions, and then I want you to wrap up your story about how you got out of full yeah. preterism too, because people are probably wondering how that happened. But back to Gary Demar, um, how I left. Yeah, yeah. We'll, we'll we'll get to that in just a moment. I um G Gary Demar. Or is he full preterist now or just accepting of full preterists? Where, where is he? Gary Demar is 99. When you die, you get your body in heaven. There may not necessarily be an end to history. And if there is, the Bible doesn't say anything about it. So he's like agnostic on the issue. Kind Jesus of. may in this one but if there is the bible really doesn't say a whole lot about it what passage are you going to use to defend that idea to which he would not revert and say that's 70 80. Hmm. Um, so he yeah yeah a, 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 an agnostic kind of a approach to it and then number two gary uh, absolutely refuses to see hyperpreterism as heretical he just won't okay. condemn it so that's that's where he that's which everything in my book, if I were a full preterist, I would say, welcome to the club, Gary. Good to have you on board. So going to that theological point, then getting a new body in heaven. Could you explain what that is from a full preterist? That view? was Ed Stevens's view. And that was also J. Stuart Russell. So that's, you know, Milton Terry, J. Stuart Russell, with these guys. So and you find some theologians uh, straight like a guy named George Bush. And there's a few others that float this idea. These are some renegade theologians, um, teachers at Cambridge or Oxford or someplace back in 1835 or something. 
And so they would write a book and they would come out with the view that, you know, maybe Paul is saying we get a new body, a spiritual body when we die and when we get to heaven. You have to keep in mind the 19th century rationalism is just, it's, it, it is, it's everywhere. It's, it's mm. the rationally explaining through science and scientific methodology, uh, the scriptures. And so the idea of molecules being recollected back together and coming out of the dust, you know, that's just. They just reject that outright. <laughs> I mean, come on. Okay. I mean, that, goodness gracious. The dead do not live. That's been dead growing up next to a tree that becomes an apple tree and it's eaten by. And then the molecules of that person. I mean, who, you know, you've heard, you've heard this before. Yeah. Interestingly enough, so did Justin Martyr, because it's the same argument they were using in the second century. And Justin had a very good answer for it, and that's my answer. Hmm. So, but these rationalist critics, you know, uh, and that's still with us today. Wanting a rational, you know, Paul, you know, really didn't believe in his words, and it's ambiguous what he's saying. There's not ambiguous. They try to make it ambiguous, but it's not. Um, you know, get a body in heaven and all. That. So that's Milton, Ru Milton, Terry, and, and these guys, and Demar just buys buys right into that but we know that that's just not the, the christian biblical doctrine it's not we believe in resurrection of the body or well, the westminster confession would say self-same body mm -hmm. identity continuity form substance we, so the full prayer believes we're in the new earth right now because yeah. all of revelations fulfilled so we're in the new earth now and when we die uh, some of them are saying we would get a new body in a, in the new heaven yeah Wherever that is. And that's so we get the experience of the new earth now. And when we die, we get the experience of the new heaven. Yeah. Basically. Interesting. Okay. And then you add, you press them on what is new earth. This new earth. What does that mean? Oh, that's just basically we're in the new covenant now. Yeah. Everything is uh, everything. It's nothing Revelation. to do with biology or geography or topography or. Hmm. No. So nothing Revelation... to do with that. Revelation 21, 22 is largely then spiritualized, the new Jerusalem, totally. um, all yeah. of that. Well, but the, but they would say, too, like where it talks about people are outside of the gate. you got sinners outside of the gate there, and they'll say that's like, they'll almost make that a little more literal and say those who are outside of faith in Jesus, yeah. that's happening yeah. today. But when it comes to a new Jerusalem, this humongous cube and everything, that's all spiritual. Yeah. You, you see the arbitrary. Yeah function picking and choosing what's spiritual what's not mm -hmm. um you know they to make because you got to make it fit and that outside the gate now that you read commentaries even the last 200 years and a lot of a lot of great exegetes you know they struggle over that when they you know what do they mean outside the gate you know is there people still alive outside well but if the gates that he's talking to in the present is in heaven and it's the entering into the gates and then everything outside the gates you still well then it makes sense it, it's not outside of the gates when the new heavens and new earth are on and then you still have these sinners in the new he's not saying that mm. you, he, he's not saying that. so that for a while i was reading it that he was and so as long as you're reading it that that way because i i still hear this argument from full prayers today no what about outside the gates he said, well, let's, let's read this outside the gates. What is he talking about? The gates, where are the gates? Well, where, where are they? They're, well, they're in heaven. Bingo. Everyone outside of heaven are sinners. Like people doing stuff here on earth. So there's heaven and then there's earth. In the new heavens and the new earth, they're one. And there are no outside the gates. Hmm. It's, he's still writing in the present tense outside the gates well blessed are those who wash the robes so that they may enter the gates yeah that's like Jesus saying enter my good and faithful servant when? when I separate the sheep and the goats and after he separates the sheep and the goats and he says to the sheep because you did all these things then he says enter into the kingdom you may enter into the kingdom of God so that's how I you know, and seeing that now, and then many other GK Bill and many other competent guys see it that way. And I thought, yeah, that's so you they they use a lot of exegesis that at first sounds uh, great. And again, young, impressionable minds, it sounds great. 
and it all flows. But when you start picking it apart, and that's how I left. I continued to have the personality that I had, which was picking things apart. And I kept picking apart even my own full preterist mm -hmm. view. And I started finding some real big holes. And the biggest one was John six in the last day. Mm -hmm. That was the, that was the biggest, all that come to me, all that the father has given to me, everything that has been given to me, I will raise up whosoever believeth in me, whosoever comes to me, I will raise him up in the last day. All who believe in me, I will raise up them up in the last day. Mm -hmm. I thought, well, that's, that's it. Um, and interestingly, because full preterism at its infancy, uh, Max King in his volume written in 86, he doesn't address John 6. Hmm. So I scrambled to find literature on this. Now, the partial preterists were fine with it. You know, well, it's resurrection, last day. That's the last day of, of history. So they, they could stick on that. Um, but the full preterists, they were having, uh, there wasn't any literature. So I, I scrambled around and looked for John, Don Preston. I couldn't find anything circa 2008 back. I couldn't find anything that he had written on this. I couldn't find, so I started floating it out there to my full preterist colleagues. Like, Hey, John six, nobody's really, really written on this. Like last day, what does that mean? Well, it's the last day of the Jewish economy, 70 AD. Well, then there's no more, more resurrection. To which some would say, yeah, you'd be right. There is no more resurrection. Wow. I thought, well, so then resurrection doesn't apply to us at all then anymore, being post-70 AD. Yeah, I guess it would. Well, then what? Well, then we can't say regeneration is resurrection mm. then. So, so then the, the, the my logic preterist. is kicking. I'm like, well, well, no, you can, but and I thought, no. See, the traditionalists don't run into this problem because when the new heavens and new earth come, there is no more resurrection after that. So, a traditional, it. a traditional full preterist says 70 AD resurrection, everything is done. It's there done. More, but there are more like non traditionalist preterists who will say, well, our regeneration, our salvation is a spiritual resurrection. And then even some more non-traditionalist preterists will say that, and there's another resurrection when we die, we get a new body in heaven. That's the last day, the last day of your existence. Ah, oh, okay. That's what Jesus was saying. And I'm like, that's, there's no way you could get that out of John 6. Hmm. Uh, and there's no way a Jew in the first century would have heard that. Hmm. A Jew in the first century would have heard resurrection of all. And secondly, in John 12, it mentions the judgment of those who are condemned in the last day. You got a problem here. Um, this is, so I debated Michael Miano, who's a hyper preterist. And I said, so, so when are, are you drawn to Jesus? Have you, are you in the hand of Jesus? Have you been given into the hand of Jesus by the Father? All those who were given to me by the Father. And he said, yes. I said, okay. When are you going to be raised? And he just stuck right there. He said, well, I, I, already, I already am raised. I said, well, when? Well, I, I'm, I'm, I'm raised by the Spirit in me. And I said, well, but... When is the last day? Because that's that's the last day is when he said he's going to raise all those in the last day. Well, that was 70 AD. That doesn't apply to them. And then he says it. Resurrection no longer applies to me. And I Ooh. thought, I rest my case. I don't need to do anything else. I don't, I'm done here. Now, if you want to believe that, great. But I'm not going to spend any more exegetical jots and tittles on this because you've just heard it from them. If you want to be a full preterist, that's what you have to believe. And I, I just left it at that. And that's wow. when I, I I was like, I'm, I can't, we don't believe in progressive sanctification anymore. We don't believe in meeting in the church, the communion, baptism. We're, we're just, we're throwing it all out. And uh, we're still calling ourselves historic Christians. See, that was a rub for me. Mm -hmm. It's like, we can't, 
we're, we're not historic Christians. If we were, then so are the Mormons. Yeah, yeah. And I, I'm in Utah. I don't know if you know that. So, yeah. I saw that on your blog you had some work with yeah. Mormons. I just did a show with another brother that uh, was an ex Mormon. Oh, actually. wow. That last podcast that I did. Hmm. Um, and so, but I would have no problems because they believe in Jesus and the Bible and heaven and dying and going to heaven. They believe in a new heaven, new earth. They, don't they? Yeah. They say they do. Yeah. So, oh, yeah. Oh, their definitions are different. Eh. Correct. So? Yeah, it's a new heaven and a new so, earth that you can lot. create whenever you become a god one day. So yeah, we, we can agree to disagree with the Mormons. Yeah, right. Still brothers. You know, no they kidding. love Jesus. Yeah. Jeez. And they live good moral lives. Yeah. Most Mormons that I've met, um, they give you the shirt off their back. These guys yeah. would build a barn for you in the back of their yard yeah. if you wanted that to happen. They they'll drive 25 miles out of their way to help you load something to throw trash out. I mean, these guys are doing what Christians should be doing. Um, that's one thing I admire about Mormons. It, you know, how many Baptists do you see going door to door, knocking on the door? Have you heard the word of God today? Mm. You know, the, give I got a hand. That, so why would I not allow Mormons? So it's doctrine. It's not character. They have good morals. Mm. As far as I can see. Yeah. Um, so why, why do we treat the full preterist this way? So that was my, my thing. I hate being in the case. I, you look, I'm a, I try to be a nice guy, right? I don't want to condemn anybody. I don't want to, I, you know, Paul says, get, live at peace with everyone as much as within you mm. be peacemakers. And so I don't like pointing the finger and you're going, I, I don't like doing, I don't like being in that position. And I try to get along, and I do get along with a lot of full preterists. They're still friends, whatever. Um, it's it's a consistent thing with me. It's and, and it troubles my heart deeply. I pray about this devotionally uh, to my Father in heaven. I, I I try to with tears sometimes in my eyes because I I I really struggle, mm. brother. Um, you know, Jeremy, over this. I I really struggle over mm. it. So when I see the Damars, I understand what he's doing. But then there's the theologian side of me that kicks in and the word of God side that kicks in and says, if you're going to do that, you're going to go down the Unitarians and the Universal and the Mormon and go down the whole route, go the whole route. There's no, and you know, PCUSA, go, go the whole route. Have you seen people go from full preterism to? Unitarianism, Universalism, all that stuff? No, but uh, yeah, uh, Universalism. So Max King's outfit, Living Presence, that whole ministry there, Max passed away. And so Doug King now runs it. And that's probably one of the larger uh, divisions. Then you have the Don Prestons and then the Ed Stevenses uh, group. So there's three main groups. You have, uh, well, actually four. <laughs> so... In full preterism, there's four main groups. So you've got the Living Presence Max King Universalists group. Pretty large number right there of them went that way. Um, then you have the Don Preston's Covenant Eschatology uh, kind of stuff. Michael Sullivan, that kind of stuff. You, you've got that going on. And then you have the Ed, Pre Ed Stevens view, and they try to remain as reformed as they mostly mm. can. These are the guys that say you get a body when you go to heaven, you get a body. And they, so they try to stay in that structure, creedal structure, as much as they possibly can. But they are hyper preterist. And then you have this other group that started around 2006, and they're called the Israel Only Group. And this group is growing in the full preterist world, which is not a very big world, but, you know, big enough to deal with. They're growing because they're saying that the whole Bible has to do only with Israel and Israel's covenant was fulfilled in 70 AD and that's it. Nothing in the Bible applies to you or me today mm -hmm. at all, really, in any way, shape, or form, other than maybe some general moral aphorisms and some maxims. But Does other that include than... like black Hebrew Israelite type guys? Kind or... of stuff like that kind of stuff. So I debated one of those uh, on yeah. full preterism, actually. Kind of that. Um, and... Uh... It was definitely different because I was using Don Preston and Michael Sullivan and those guys to prep for that debate. 
<laughs> and I, when I encountered him, I was like, oh, this is a different brand. Uh, yeah, that's different. <laughs> This is something way different than anything I've ever heard, actually. So, yeah. It's kind of one of those things, though. The black, you know, black Hebrew roots thing. Yeah. I dabbled a little in the literature there, and I thought, eh, this is British Israel, it, British Israel, Anglo, uh, what was that, World Church of God, mm. um, uh, Armstrong. Mm. It's coming out. I thought, this stuff is. Well, just to, to wrap up. Britons are not the lost tribes. It, come on where do we where do we come up with this well, well one of the profound things to me in that debate was i asked him could you understand the word of god on your own without extra biblical insights from like he was big on josephus and others would you be able to understand what jesus said through studying the word of god and he said no who he said just, that uh, this guy debated uh oh yeah he was like, a, yeah, more of the black Hebrew Israelite yeah. type. Yeah, of without just see, there's 67 books in the Bible. It's a book of Josephus. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah, and for others, they would like the 68 books. We'd bad the Book of Enoch. Oh my word! Oh, okay. that one in there too. Well, um, I know we've really stretched the time that you had, but just final thought, final question on how you've been treated by that community that you used to be a part of. How have the full preterist been toward you since you've defected from their ranks? uh not well i mean it, and i've not been nice either you know been, <laughs> at least you admit it uh, yeah i mean i was they're heretics i i say what it is it's it's it is what it is um yeah but not not i've been called every name in the book i'm apostate i don't love jesus i'm only in this for the money um, you know, if they knew my life, I, they wouldn't, I mean, my wife hears stuff like that and she's like, who are they? They're not talking about you. Yeah. Well, I mean, the studio yeah, that you. you're sitting in this, this, uh, what is that? A hundred thousand dollar studio you're sitting in. I mean, it's yeah. clearly you're yeah. in this for the money. Yeah. I mean, well, I converted the downstairs into a library. But <laughs> other than that, I might turn it into, I've got the drums in the studio over there. <laughs> all right. Yeah. I've got keyboard studio, guitars, all that. So uh but you know it uh, yeah that, uh, not nice mm -hmm. it's not nice because i'm i'm you know it's i i'm a church man so most of the time i'm either you know in chaplaincy or church these are my two areas Ma mostly church um so like today i'm going to paint the inside of a church so i'm always doing something at yeah. church and then, or uh, I'm writing and, and, and researching. So I'm working on several books, you know, doing that kind of this personal personal study. So that takes hours out of the day, just just reading. Um, and I have the luxury of time of being able to, to, to do that. I'm set up to where I, I have that, mm. that luxury of being able to read for hours on a given, any, you know, given days. So, and I've been doing that for, you know, 10 years, just reading, 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 mm. as you can tell, you know, read, read, read. Yeah. Um, and then in, in, in writing. So that's the majority of the time, but my ministry, because I came out of this full preterism, um, I, and because I was such a major player in it and then left it, I'm one of the, few there's been william benson there's been several there's been hundreds i get emails at least once a week from people uh people that are have left it have looked at it have considered it i want nothing to do with it glad they didn't go down that route thank you sam from preventing me from going down that route of seeing it before mm -hmm. i got there so it's i'm operating in a two front like preventing people from either going down it um or ever considering it or those who are in it coming out of it to which now have numbered into the hundreds mm. i would say over the last 10 years definitely into the definitely uh as the lord is my witness definitely in to the hundreds um that have come out of it Just reading my, you know my work or the book and so that's the holy spirit doing what he's doing i believe how i see it um i'm just an unprofitable servant doing this and i was going to leave the whole thing and stop dealing with it and um, Jeremiah 
Nordier is the one that called me back. Yeah. <laughs> he said, no, he's a young guy like you're saying. He's, he's like, no, don't leave. We need to expose this. I just got two best friends, pastors of mine. They've become hyper preterists. So it pops up here and there. And he goes, oh, you got to stay here and keep doing this. Well, and so I, YouTube has really helped the movement, I think. Oh, without YouTube, forget it. Yeah. Yeah. That, yeah, no, yeah, the media, Facebook, without that, there's this. Because, again, I work at a lot in the different churches, uh, different pastors. I know a lot in the area of uh, ministerial association, local things. And so I talk, you know, Nazarenes, Methodist, Assemblies of God, Four Square Church where I grew up, you know, these kind of. They never heard of this stuff. Hmm. So they first hear Jesus. I said, what? You, on Facebook, you write about this predator. So what? what is that? And I said, well. The resurrection and Jesus, it was all 70 AD. And they thought, well, that's the dumbest thing I've ever heard in my life. And then we move on to something else. Yeah. <laughs> because it's just such a, an earth shattering. Yeah. If there's no one in thing, your church like, it up, if there's not, if there's not a pressing issue, it's like totally don't even bother. Don't waste your time until you, you need to use your time to study it. Right. More interested in, uh, the issues that are affecting us today yeah than a nutty issue that the resurrection of the dead happened in 70, 70 AD right that's just we're we've got some big fish here mm. <laughs> to fry and that's not one of them so that's and i am pleased i uh getting back into church work in the last um and we you know finish here but getting back into church work heavily in the last six years. Um, and when I mean involved, involved. So I'm involved in several local churches uh, getting to know. In fact, I'm speaking at a Methodist church next week, even though I'm involved with the Presbyterian church. Well, but you're, I'm still you're shoulders with all kinds of liberals. Right, yeah. <laughs> well, just area ministers, I just call them, you know, I want to meet these guys. I want to meet them, have lunch with them, coffee. Yeah. You know, that, you know, that kind of stuff. And I'm very, very, very pleased. Um, that the vast majority of the Nazarenes and Methodists and Assemblies of God and all these guys, Charismatics, Independents, Churches of Christ, Disciples of Christ, never have heard of this stuff. Mm. Never heard of Don Preston, never heard of Max King, never heard of Gary DeMar mm. or Doug Wilson or Jeff Durb, never heard of them. And then it hit me, oh, this stuff doesn't go on in, outside of my echo chamber circle here, reformed, reformed world. Outside of this, no one's ever heard of Cornelius Van Til. <laughs> <laughs> they don't know who he is. You yeah. go to Cambridge or Oxford, never heard of the guy. Wow. Yeah. So that's, and I've stepped out of that world into the more academic, broad kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, does that make sense? We get into our own. Oh. And I know a dispensationalist, Clarence Larkin, yeah, you're just, you're, you're just reading. <laughs> These guys. No one's talking about Clarence Anybody Larkin is. anymore. All right, but I know no uh, one reads Larkin. I've got Larkin's books actually. First oh, yeah. well, they're, yeah, they're first fun. They're, they're, a lot of time and effort went into those. But yeah, I mean, <laughs> yeah, um, the big charts. The the problem. One of the big major problems with social media is we develop our own echo chambers. Absolutely, and we, yes, we are do. so ignorant about what's actually going on in the world and the issues that people actually care about because we yes. go in and customize what we want to talk about, what we want to hear about. And then we're locked in. And, uh, and I would say to you and, and you of their age going in ministry, pastoral, please don't do that. Yeah. There's a big world. There's a big world out there that's going on. That is not fighting over whether or not we have free will or God determines all things. And the, yeah, the people are not the, fighting about that, nor do they care. The people in the pews need you to address the issues that their daughter's on drugs right now. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. That's it. And and I just caught her uh cutting herself. Yeah. Right. So uh that's that's where you gotta hit it. Yes. And this other stuff's great and fun and everything, but uh, is, I'm learning that real fast in the last six years. Like, you know what? They don't people <laughs> they don't spend their time talking about this stuff. Yeah. But as a theologian, I want to talk about it all the time. Well, it's, it's a lot of fun. And this conversation is yeah, a fantastic fun. conversation. I've loved it. But we have to also admit, this is going to help a select number of people, not everybody. <laughs> so, yeah. Right. And I don't want to dismiss doctrine. Like I said, I've spent my, you know, having my doctorate, so I've spent my whole life. And there is application. And hyperpreterism would be one area where, you know, 
that's not going to help the person on drugs. Hmm. Um, I've seen a lot of alcoholics that were full predators because, and it didn't make any difference about their alcoholism because that's not sin anymore. So yeah, yeah, that doctrine matters. So I don't want to definitely, definitely don't want to say totally. that. Yep. I mean, sometimes yeah, I mean, we can get so heady out here that it, it just doesn't. We have this whole ministry called do theology. I mean, we're into that sort of thing, but we also have to recognize it's not for everybody what they're going through right now. And there's, yeah, we, we can get really caught up in thinking small things are big things um, or vice versa. So we have to be, uh, have to check our perspective on those things, but that's a good so note to end on. Uh, Dr. Frost, thanks so much for joining me today. Thank you. Thank you. Your time. This has been a really good conversation. It is going to help a lot of people who are dealing with this. And so I pray and hope you. it does. Yeah. Very good. God bless you. Thank you.